Hello. It's time for the visit with the person of high strangeness. Um, I really appreciate um, my staff and all the, the friends that have been watching us for all this time. And um, just to remind you that ever once in a while, we talk about the fact that we live in really stressful times. Now, a lot of the friends um, are baby boomers, and we seem to have one little problem after another. Sometimes it's physical, and sometimes it's important that we find a syndrome or a disorder uh, uh, that we can name something, either uh, one or the other, because that's the only way that we can deal with life. And so it shouldn't be surprising that um, a couple of the shows really stuck out in your memory. Uh, one was the one with Mona, the one that was called, uh, uh, I forgot what it was called. Oh, Rude Awakening to Mental Illness. And, uh, and in that show, uh, a young woman named Catherine um, Peel, she decided uh, to document the show. And uh, so you got a glimpse of some of the things that, uh, in her philosophies that uh, she looked at it like that. Then the next time we did another one where I introduced Catherine to you on a personal basis so you could understand her as a person, um, how she grew up and how she became who, who she is. And so I'm really excited today to have Catherine back. Um, and how are you, Catherine? I'm, I'm wonderful, thanks. And like I was, I'm stuttering already. We haven't even got going. I'm a little <laughs> intimidated in my own way here. Really? Well, yeah, because today we're going to get real technical, um, you know, with some of your philosophies. Because after all, you are the, um, are you the inventor or are you the person that thought of well, your program? Yeah, I guess you could say that. I. I'm what you call maybe an emotion theorist. I have mm -hmm. been studying what emotion actually is, mm -hmm. and I probably am one of one of the only ones that has a really all-encompassing uh, perspective on what it is. Mm -hmm. So, are you the inventor, or are you the the person that put it? Uh, that's what I'm. Yeah, um, but I'm not sure about. I, I guess maybe more discoverer. It might oh, be, that's a better might, word. Might be mm -hmm. a little more because I certainly didn't make it up. But my mm -hmm. my strength has been in being able to recognize the patterns um, that exist within human behavior and all and all the patterns that were out there in terms of um, psychological literature, mm -hmm. sociological literature, major patterns and trends in uh, religion, and just all the evidence to sort of pull together and make sense of what was going on with emotion. Mm -hmm. That's what my life has been about. And I really hope that you can take a deep breath and forget <laughs> all about being intimidated, because it's going to be, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to mm -hmm. be able to practice talking about something that I've been thinking about and struggling with words for a long time. So if um, I promise to relax about that, I'm, what I want you to help me do is to pull out of me the most common sense sort of ways of talking about these things because I've been in in isolation for a long time mm -hmm. with these ideas and communicating with more scientific mm -hmm. jargon so mm -hmm. so be careful what you ask for. I don't <laughs> because sometimes I do pull rather hard you know good I yeah. want you to do that because this is an excellent opportunity to, for me to try to put into words something that is really bigger and beyond the way we use language at this time mm -hmm. so I've had to basically reinvent and redefine many of the words that I put together in a specific way mm -hmm. to help us think about emotion in a brand new way. So what I think uh, my work here, I want to remind the friends that this is a sort of a, um, an opening for a show, another show we're going to do later. Uh, and at that time, we're going to show you how to put in well, what I found when I'm trying to talk about this, and I've worked with a lot of people with one-on-one -on -one counseling, and I'm doing seminar classes to sort of test how to communicate the ideas which resonate most with, with people mm -hmm. from all walks of life. And what I found is that talking about how to do it really is like putting the cart before the horse, because exactly. we need Th to know. Yeah, that's where I was going with that. We need to know what it is. That's right. So that's right. I thought that the most productive use mm -hmm. of this time would be for me to try different sort of approaches to explain what it is. 
that emotion is and does because there's so many misconceptions about it out there and we we really are taught so many things that we take for granted as factual and when you really start looking at what emotion is it turns so many things upside down that many common ways of looking at life are simply inaccurate yeah so so maybe we could encourage the friend uh, the friends if this is really important uh, maybe they want to take a piece of paper and a pencil and make some uh, so like highlights or a word and then save it for a later time because uh, that's where we were going that's a great today idea. you're going to explain what it is and then at a later time in a few weeks then we can refresh their memory uh, what everything was and then you're going to teach them how to put it into action great there you go and i'm hoping that in the course of while well, i'm trying to explain what it is mm -hmm. that maybe we can any, all the friends that are listening and anyone interested can recognize those patterns within that's themselves right. because we're not talking about something that's new. We're not talking about something that's foreign. We're talking about something that we all live with every day, but we don't really recognize it. It's like, it's, it's like having a, a wonderful spirit guide or a guardian angel or a, a direct access to a specific kind of information, and we don't know that it's there. We haven't tuned into that channel. We don't know how to decode the signals that we mm -hmm. receive constantly. So um, that's what I want to talk about. So how about uh, you could almost put it into um, lecture form and then it's up to me to ever once in a while interrupt you uh, with something totally <laughs> unintelligent and we get balanced it out again. <laughs> so I'm going to give you the floor for a while, great. okay? That sounds mm -hmm. great. And I've, I've kind of always struggled on how sort of to introduce this and I want to try something new on you today. Um, Think about, suppose, just suppose the new uh, Microsoft catalog came out and they had come up with a new sort of little mini computer like the Palm Pilot, something really incredibly sophisticated that drew, drew upon databases of information without limit that you could program for yourself. You put it in your pocket and every day as you're going about your daily living, it would start to beep whenever you needed to stop and get information about something. So you'd pull it out of your pocket and you'd say, you'd read that it says, uh-oh, you were just thinking about some, something you just thought or something you just did was not in your best interest and here's what you need to do to fix it. I mean, that would really be a pretty cool machine. I, I've seen uh, people that sell learning machines that are supposed to help you learn, and, but nothing anywhere close to something like that. And we're just assuming, of course, that, that it would be mm -hmm. a valid working device, because that's what I'm talking about. But we could ask Mr. Gates, maybe he'll <laughs> we'll do it. Well, we'll just see about that. But <coughs> Excuse me. also, too, suppose that this device, um, with the information that it gave you, allowed you to develop the most full and complete potential, all your genetic potential, all whatever your particular destiny might be, that if you listened to it and followed it at every point in your life, you lived this most full, rewarding life as possible, which also made you extremely happy. Mm -hmm. um, it also... Are you going to have some of the friends that said, well, it sounds like programming. Good question. In fact, you're, you're getting ahead of me, and maybe, oh. maybe we need to just skip right up to that point. But my, what I was going to say about the machine is that it ends up being a moral compass as well as mm -hmm. a guidance for you. It, it's a guidance how to interact with other people in the highest sense of, of every kind of morality that's out there, as well as to help you develop the most um, effective personality, the most fun, the most likable kind of, it does all those things for you. So Lillian's immediate question is, how do I know that the programmers at Microsoft really have my self-interest. I mean, maybe this That's is some right. alien technology where they want to implant information into me that, right here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that controls me and makes me want to do things like uh, the movie The Matrix. Did you see that? Oh, it was awesome, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. But well, not so far-fetched, though. Not at all. Not at all, because the power of the mind is, is incredible. We have this huge breadth of free will. Mm -hmm. And we have so many choices to make in every moment of every day and very little guidance on how to make those choices. So what I guess personal development and spirituality and consciousness expansion is all about is about becoming more aware of all the information that we have. So we have something like that little Palm Pilot pocket thing. Now, the, the problem with that, of course, is the only way we could ever really know that that information was in our best interest was if it was something that's built right into the human design. 
Ah. And so where I'm going with this is that we have that already. We don't have to pay Bill Gates for it. We don't have to wait till it mm -hmm. comes out. We don't have to worry about alien technology because we were given just exactly that kind of machine. And it operates through our emotional system. It is our emotional system. It is an entire sensory network that hooks us into many, many, many levels of information, however we're able to consciously perceive. So it not only guides us through giving us information, but it also moves us at the physical level to push us and pull us in the right directions. So what's happening is we're not aware that our emotional system is this tremendous guidance system, that it is pulling us toward the true north of mm -hmm. joy. Uh, this is why I brought um, some of the things that I did for the table today. And joy is, is right there in the center of the table because joy is the feeling that we all want. It is the ultimate sort of goal um, for every one of our pursuits, whether it's a feeling of accomplishment, whether it's a feeling of love, whether it's a feeling of caring and nurturing and giving and sharing our gifts with the universe, uh, receiving our gifts from the universe and feeling grateful about and, and, and connected and devoted to that source. These are all aspects of the experience of joy. That is where our evolutionary destiny lies and that we as a species have not recognized this sensory system that is pulling us in this direction. And so we remain at the opposite end of the spectrum, which is fear. Mm -hmm. And fear is the negative pull, and, and, and it's not to say that it's any worse or better. What it is to say is that it, that's the aspect of emotion that moves us away from mm -hmm. things that we need to do to protect our potentials, to pr fulfill our needs, to survive. And where science is kind of lagging a little bit behind is in recognizing that there's more going on than just survival. Mm -hmm. The whole, um, one of the reasons that I became a more fallen scientist than a more a legitimate scientist was because of the limitations that went along with the idea of Darwinian evolution being, survival being the only thing that's going on with human nature or in any, any other kind of animal behavior because it's, What's really going on is both protection and growth, and they're the two mm -hmm. dynamics that drive evolution itself. Well, you know, as you know yourself, in, in we have to be grateful for you know these these things that you come up with because uh, when you have a mentally challenged person, sometimes uh, what the scientists dictate and what it really is is so far, uh, you know, it's like from one end to another. <laughs> And I totally so, agree with that. And so, so at, you know, there's things out there and people out there that can sort of bend the rules a little bit and make it very simple. That's why I said, you know, I'm a little intimidated at this time because um, we think everything has to be done by the book. And then, of course, you rewrote your yeah, book. <laughs> you got pictures on here and everything. Well, the official book is, is not yet... Mm -hmm. um, really quite ready for this, although there have been some really wonderful changes that have started to happen very recently mm -hmm. in the psychological community where they're beginning to embrace some of these ideas. In fact, there is a trend um, in psychology, which is the realm of science that mm -hmm. I consider my own, although maybe I'm a maverick. Yeah. Um, there's a trend toward positive psychology, where instead of having, remember the book that I showed you when we did the piece on Mona, which is the DSM for the revised? That's the one I was thinking it, of, yeah. It, it basically has all of these wonderful disorders about all the things that can go wrong with the humanity. Big red one, huh? Yeah, and, yeah, and what you do is you, you throw a chemical yeah. at it because this person's off balance. This person yeah. isn't normal, so yeah. they have this disorder. I mean, there's even a disorder now for being on the internet too long, an, addi an addictive Addict. disorder. I mean, come on. it's. It, 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 it's a reverse way of looking at what goes wrong with humanity. Now, the trend in positive psychology is what goes right. They, mm -hmm. In fact, there's um, a gentleman by the name of Martin Seligman, who's one of like the grandfather of mm -hmm. all psychology at this point, and, and someone I respect very, very much, who's spearheading a trend toward positive psychology. And their goal is to look at what goes right with human beings and what are the conditions that make those things go right. And he, in fact, is one of the people who is interested in my work in, in recognizing how the emotional system really is nature's mm -hmm. innate value system. And it does push us in certain directions and pull us. 
And what they're beginning to realize is that a lot of the things that they call mental disorders are basically just misuse of this system. Mm -hmm. I mean, almost every one of the disorders is characterized by some sort of an emotional difficulty, experiencing feelings uh, like uh, excessive sadness is, of course, depression, and excessive mm -hmm. anger shows up as rage and in violent behaviors sometimes. These are emotions, but that they're, they're not just throwbacks from some animal uh, vestige like an appendix that we don't need anymore, not at all. Those are the things that we need to understand to protect uh, our, our freedom and our choice and our very mm -hmm. consciousness and our ability to choose our own life. Now, the, the favorite, most favorite thing in it, there's a lot of good things, and in, in a way, it reminded me of some of the homemade remedies I use sometimes. And my favorite part was here um, on the semi autopilot where you talk about you give 10 different scenarios about a baby crying. Mm -hmm. Can we? kind of start with that because yeah. that's really the building block of everything. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you remember it? If not, oh, I'll Oh, sure. Are you book. kidding? <laughs> <laughs> um, what Lillian's talking about is, and then this gets into the how-to, obviously, but it's, it's a really important piece to recognize that this emotional sense that we relate to, it, it, it operates on an unconscious level until we become conscious of the higher informational aspects of it. So as as soon as we're born, we automatically start to learn through this system and to develop a personality one way or the other, whether it's unconscious or mm -hmm. conscious. And the world that we live in today really doesn't understand that this is going on. They, they don't recognize that we are intended to learn through trial and error, but that the uh, environment that we live in, since we are a cooperative, intelligent, conscious species, is supposed to do its part in facilitating a trial and error situation. So we can immediately get off track if our environment, usually it's our parents, our first early environment, does not satisfy our early attempts to be free. So what happens is the minute a baby is born, it attempts to control its own environment. That's what the emotional sense is all about. I, I talk about it in terms of self-regulation mm -hmm. because of the science that's necessary because we're talking about a system that's intertwined with the immune system, the uh, adrenal system, the that's nervous right. system. It is throughout the entire being on all mental, physical, and spiritual levels, energetic levels. Mm -hmm. So it is, it steers us and moves us from day one. So to regulate ourselves, mm -hmm. we're not supposed to be regulated by our parents or our teachers or by lawyers or by exactly, yeah. you know, prison guards or, or even by yeah. church leaders. We are supposed to learn to regulate ourselves through the emotional system. Right, so we get ejected very violently and then somebody slaps us and changes our breathing pattern and here we are in the world. Yeah, you're talking on a really great level of abstraction. Uh, what happens is when we're born into the world and mm -hmm. we're suddenly, we have this beautiful thing called a mind. It's a blank slate. It's our focus, focal point of consciousness. It is how we can create our reality and manifest our destiny through a set of belief structures that we adopt through trial and error ex experience. Mm -hmm. Your set of belief structures is completely unique to your experience, your that's family, right. your, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the beauty of free will. We can build whatever we want with that mind. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, the beauty of life itself. We get to have new and creative experience being physical human beings. So the minute we're born into the world, we automatically find ourselves in this place with all of these rules, mm -hmm. but we have this system to guide us. So as soon as we feel pain, because emotion is, of course, the joy and fear is, is pleasure and pain right. at its rudimentary level. And I mean, we're talking animals and everybody is run by this, That's all right. the way down to mm -hmm. electrons, which are um, operate on the positive and negative attraction and repulsion of electricity. With human beings, we have a much broader bandwidth of information, so we respond electrically, chemically, motivationally, and experientially mm -hmm. to emotion. So the first thing that means to us, the first thing we become conscious of is pain, perhaps, because we're hungry. Mm 
That's and our right. automatic response to that is to try to fix it, to correct it. And our automatic behavior is to cry, is to communicate to our environment, to try to do something to change the environment to fix what's wrong with us. Mm -hmm. So of course, usually, in the best of circumstances, we have a mother or mm -hmm. a caregiver or a provider that comes and answers our cry. They nurse us, they change us, they love us, and through that simple interaction, there's a satisfaction within the emotional system that I can control my environment. And the emotional, as soon as the pleasure, pleasure tells us, oh, I did good, and I learned from that. That's fine. And we're not really, what the psychologists want to say, conscious of this yet, because there's this beautiful thing called conditioned learning mm -hmm. with Pavlov's dog and all that, where the emotional memory gets paired with the experience in our memory and we get reflexes and habits based around that even if we're not even aware of it. So the next time I feel pain I automatically cry without even thinking about it, mom automatically comes. Mm -hmm. So you immediately get this cycle and how emotion works is through this feedback mm -hmm. cycle of we act, something happens, we perceive an outcome of what happened with our mind which is complete with our own perceptual uh, distortions, mm -hmm. but the emotion that follows, in fact, comes so tightly bound to it that we think it's sometimes the same thing, is the ultimate guide that tells us this was purposeful or this was not. Mm -hmm. And not only does it informationally tell us that, but it comes with a motivational component to motivate us, whether we get it or not, mm -hmm. in a corrective manner. And the corrective motivations are to um, approach that which mm -hmm. feels pleasurable, to avoid that which feels painful, and to fight against that which tries to control us against our will. Mm -hmm. So we have these impulses that get stronger and stronger based upon our memories and but at some point we become aware that there's information in the feeling of anger there's information in the feeling of fear and this is the level that we're not aware of yet as a society mm -hmm. and that's what my work is really all about is decoding the information within mm -hmm. that that gives us guidance that really does show us exactly what to think how not what to think but how to think and how to act in every situation in a way that you're going to evolve your own consciousness mm -hmm. and be able to express your gifts most fully to make the changes in the world mm -hmm. that drive cultural ev evolution so you're not only adapting yourself you are adapting the world and this is a beautiful interaction that drives all of evolution whether you're a human being an animal an atom uh, you know, an amoeba, we're all motivated by these inner motivational self-regulating principles that are s as simple as pleasure and pain. Now, um, you talk about electrons and the electrical <laughs> systems here, and as we know, um, we, are, we have a, a, a large part of us is set up on electrical systems. You bet. Our frequencies and things. Our whole brain Excuse fires on, <laughs> on electrical synaptic chemical mm -hmm. all that wonderful stuff so so right now in in your in your system here um in your em emotional intelligence does that also include uh, that part of a short circuit that a person has sometimes so is does that come in a different category and forgive my ignorance here okay when you say short circuit what do you mean by that um when something goes in wrong. In some mental illnesses, per se, uh, a person just gets short-circuited. Mm -hmm. So can that be incorporated in the work that you do? Yes, <laughs> very much so. Well, okay, can um, we go there for a minute? Yeah. Um, since emotion, I guess I need to back up just a little bit, because what the implications of this are, and I, I am of the belief that emotion is, quite frankly, the voice of spirit. If there mm -hmm. is such a thing as a human spirit, and as a scientist, it's really um, a brazen thing for me to assume and to say that that's what's going on. But since all of this religious ideology and symbology talks about spirit, but they're really describing emotions like faith mm -hmm. and compassion and trust and love, or evil and sin, which is the stuff that happens from fear and anger, it, it, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the voice of spirit. Um, um, before I can really go where you want to go, what that really is to a scientist who is not just limited to any one mm -hmm. specialty, when you can pull the patterns together like, like I like to do, uh, what that spirit, that guidance, is ultimately what the physicists call the quantum potential. Mm -hmm. And they describe that as a body of information that provides guidance, just like uh, a, a ship on the ocean receives radio signals that tell it which way to go. 
Okay, so when I talk about emotion as a sense, I'm talking about the quantum potential that offers information in electrically, in an electrical band, mm -hmm. just like the colors of the spectrum are like orange, yellow, and red. We perceive all those different colors. We also perceive an electrical signal. We perceive a chemical signal. We perceive a motivational pain or pleasure experience. And we also perceive a higher informational component with each one of the feeling tones themselves. So we are we have access to all of this guiding information, but if we're not conscious of it, we're only operating on the electrical and the mm -hmm. chemical aspects like lower life forms. And I say that with, uh, I don't want to be anthropomorphic about this because I think what the atoms do is par far more important than what mm -hmm. we do. Because if the atoms did not know how to follow the positive and negative impulses to attract and repel, they wouldn't know how to hook together and, and, and make bonds with other chemicals like oxygen and nitrogen and all the very things that the entire ecosystem is based upon. Mm -hmm. So along with these varying levels of bandwidth, they, com they correspond with varying levels of self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a simple self-consciousness like an atom relates just to the specific electrical bandwidth mm -hmm. and it has less free will to do what it wants that's how we get this newtonian perfection of mechanical laws mm -hmm. that we can rely on and be persons and our kind of life is not possible but the more complex of a self we are the more guidance we have access to because we more we have more free will so we need this thing to tell us how to use it how to mm -hmm. make choices that aren't going to disrupt what the rest of our self organization is really trying to do because every atom and every molecule and every organ within you has its own self concept and it's doing its thing and the information that we pick up through emotion is the collection of all that information and if we're following that guidance, we're less likely to do things with our free will that hurt the entire unit. Mm -hmm. And as, as you can see, we don't do that. We, we do things to hurt ourselves, we eat the wrong stuff, we commit suicide. We, our consciousness is without guidance because we have missed out on this signal. So what you're talking about in terms of short circuits and what, what I was talking about with Mona and some mental disorders That's right. is that there are so many external situations that compromise this system, that the natural defense mechanisms that are built into the system cause what you describe as short circuits, where the different aspects and the mobility of a human consciousness, for example, someone who's profoundly abused as a child. I mean, it's one thing when mother leaves you with a soiled di diaper for a while, but she comes every now and then and feeds you, and mm -hmm. you feel re reasonably safe about the world. But in situations where people are horribly neglected and horribly abused, in fact, abuse is usually um, the number one cause of multiple personality disorder, mm -hmm. where that the child is so not prepared consciously, doesn't have the skills, the understandings, the, the conscious understanding of what's happening. And it's so horrible that the body takes over through chemical and electrical responses that defend. Yeah, and then it's And in the most extreme mm -hmm. cases, you get um, a mobility of consciousness where mm -hmm. the main personality actually goes away. And yeah. another aspect of that person or inform from the information field steps in. Yeah, now the, uh, let me get back to that red book for a minute. Sure. Okay, now uh, I think basically what what I was getting at uh, is because I've, I have really read this. Mm -hmm. Some of it I can't comprehend because I'm looking at it from my own personal view. But what happens is if you combine your system with that of a, let's say, outright scientific psychiatrist that goes by that red book, mm -hmm. And according to them, is if there is a, if there is a electrical short circuit, there is nothing you can do about it. And I think that, that's what I was going to ask you. Doesn't matter about the short circuit. You can incorporate it, and you can come out of it. You right? bet. In yeah. fact, there's an incredible amount of resiliency built into the system. Because I mean, think if you think about it. If if this grand informational pool of the quantum potential. And many people think of that as God, as the omniscient, mm -hmm. all-knowing information. If, for whatever reason, organisms have increasing amount of free will, and there's apparently um, a reason for that, and that's so that we can create and make new experience. And so 
along with that free will does come this guidance that I'm talking about. But we're allowed the flexibility to be ignorant and to still have safety mechanisms and resiliencies that can bring us back from the, the deepest depths of despair. And that's why you see people who have conquered mental illness and all these some really horribly abusive challenges. And they rise to be real heroes and leaders. Mm -hmm. And um, it, the, it, what would the world be like without people like that? But what I think is the big mistake and um, the psychological communities and the medical models that have been in use for a long time are finally beginning to give way to this recognition that it's not just a mind and a body and that the body is sick and you put chemistry into That's it right. to change. There's this beautiful dynamic interaction between mind and body and it all happens through the emotional system, through the electrical in the chemical aspects of emotion. I mean, it's proven that you can create an image in your mind complete with an emotional experience that you've created in your own mind. It's not responded. Usually it's, it's supposed to be mm -hmm. um, to follow a situation. You can create them in your mind. And the same chemicals, whether they're good ones or bad ones, go down and they agonize or antagonize the very cells of your body. And there's a, a cellular biologist who mm -hmm. uh, has been on the Elaine Smith show several times. Who you were too? Who, um, who, be, be, yeah. Let me interrupt you here. We can make reference to this. Uh, Catherine did a very technical show with <laughs> Elena Smith. I see. You might want to call her. Um, that one won't actually air for a while yet. I don't uh -huh. think. Well, neither will we. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. I think she's about five months out. Five months out. Yeah. yeah. So, and anyway, if you find this of interest and you want to get even more technical, call <laughs> Elena. Maybe she'll make an exception. <laughs> a little earlier. So oh. let's get back to you. Uh, what well, you say? I'm not sure how helpful some of that information mm -hmm. was because we really do need to cover these bases first. But. Um, I guess what I was saying with that, and you have to get me back on track, because I'm all over the place. <laughs> all over the place. Well, we have established um, what emotion is. Oh, I know where I was mm -hmm. going. Can I interrupt you for a second? Because sure. I think it's really important to throw in there that um, when you talk about recovering, mm -hmm. um, the, the DSM-4, uh, the, the book the of, book. Mm -hmm. the big book on this person is schizophrenic and this person has, uh, you know, borderline personality disorder. See, they, what they do is they dispense pills for each one of these things. They say, okay, this person must have a chemical imbalance, let's throw medication at it. So what you're seeing all over the world, and it's a really alarming trend, is Prozac. Mm -hmm. You're seeing children being given all, Ritalin, all kinds of, because it's got to be a chemical disorder and we got to fix something that's broken. That's not what's happening because the body isn't just the one that's producing the chemicals. The that's mind right. is producing the chemicals. And the more there is, the more the emotional system is forced to work against the mind, the more mix, uh, mixed up chemistry you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And what that does is that we have this beautiful continuum of, of people with these kinds of consciousnesses that I think that you probably qualify as someone whose consciousness is more mobile than the rest of yeah. us. And, and medicine doesn't do anything. Uh, well, it, in, it, it, because <laughs> it's really the art of maneuvering your brain. You bet it is. Well, it, it actually dulls your perceptions. Exactly. It messes with, I mean, every every one of those chemical cures has side effects. Yeah. And it only, it's a stab in the dark why it works anyway. Mm -hmm. There are um, some wonderful leaders in the field of neurobiology that are looking, using this model instead, mm -hmm. that are uh, coming up with AIDS cures. And uh, there, in fact, there's one being tested. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Candace Pert. She's another one one of the wonderful no. women who I admire no, greatly. Not. She's the one that recognized the mind-body connection and how emotion, or the molecules of emotion is the book that she's read. Mm -hmm. And she is just now testing an AIDS remedy based on her work and mm -hmm. it, it's real pioneering work, so. Well, uh, this morning, uh, uh, as you know, these shows are taped, but feel free to call in, you know, while it's airing. This morning, Jim, Jim Neighbors was on one of the, the programs. <laughs> really? That's right. Oh my God! And they was talking about the fact that he came within just a couple of days of death when his liver failed, you know, uh, a few years ago. And so, <laughs> excuse me. So he needed a, um, a liver transplant, and because the way his his support in his faith system was set up, he didn't feel appropriate to pray. Um, to pray or ask for his life because that would have meant someone else would have, have to die, die for him <laughs> to get the organ. And so he said he just concentrated on the very best his own body could do to hang on 
and it worked. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so he's singing again. He just put out a CD. So the mind can override a lot of impossibilities. There are tremendous potentials that are opened up when recognizing that there's something this important that's going on. And when we learn how to work with it and not against it, we find ourselves quite literally at a different state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm convinced that we're really on the brink, you know, the change of the millennium, there's a lot of, everybody knows something's happening and that there's changes and that there's really good stuff going on. And that the this kind of information coming out is really a big part of that because we, we have had this idea for centuries that uh, pain and suffering is a natural part of existence, that all the answers come from out there, from teachers, from judges, from religious leaders, and yet we, we all kind of resonate whenever we come up against the, the concept that all answers mm -hmm. lie within, because they do. And that was one thing that I think led me on my, my journey in the first place was I kept coming up against that and it felt so true, but I, I know guts and hearts and bloods and things like that in there. Where was where were the answers? And and I never really found anyone who could say exactly how to find those answers. That's what my work is about because they really are provided within the spectrum of the emotional informational system. We just need to decode the system, mm -hmm. understand how it works unconsciously, so it's work, we're working with it, caution and not against it. So we want to move away from the impulsive autopilot sort of thing that pushes us with a stick of pain and, and start riding with the, with the pleasures of, we're, we're being pulled toward faith and compassion and love and cooperation. And we're going away from the idea of competition with one another. In fact, there's trends notable throughout all society how the more interdependent we come, the better information processing we have out there, whether it's a printer, printing press or the internet, right. the more cooperative we become as a species. We're forced into it. We should, we should have noticed that a long time ago when we recognized what nuclear technology does to the entire world. And add a couple of dimensions to that. Now that puts another spin on everything. So uh, originally we was going to do a lecture, but I see that's not going to, it's not going to go that way. So we're just, just going to keep going. Yeah. Um, is there a certain age group, a certain, is there a certain group that would benefit more from your work than others? Or is that a... Uh, uh, from what I'm looking at, at, it doesn't really matter who you are, there is something in here for you. At this point, um, my struggle is, this is for everyone. It, everyone. Is, from, it mm -hmm. is for the youngest people to the oldest people. It's for the most intelligent people to the, to the least intelligent people. It's to the most successful and the, most, the least successful. In fact, the people that um, are, are probably in prison, um, the children that are in, already endangered, those are the people that are going to need it the most. Um, however, my, what my challenge is, is I put together this, it's a basic sort of seminar format that puts the ideas into more ordinary terms mm -hmm. than, although, although I've, there's plenty of good science stuff out there, if anyone's mm -hmm. interested in that. Um, and from this, what I plan to do, I've started a nonprofit organization, and my goal is to take the information and put it in packages that are understandable for mm -hmm. different age groups and different audiences and basically get funding to go and deliver it to anybody who wants it, whether they can afford it or not. Yeah, so I'm going to hold this up and, and, uh, and share with the friends how you even took the time to make little maps and, <laughs> and little people and little emotions. And, well, um, when you've been trying to describe, incredible. You, I've worked with words for so long and I, they don't work sufficiently. So I, I've tried to use um, imagery and mm -hmm. examples and things that hook into your natural emotional system because everybody has one and, mm -hmm. and, and everyone can kind of relate. But there is a lot of technical stuff in there, but it, it, there's levels of understanding and personally, I, I, when I find something like this, I find layers and layers and layers of understanding. So the first time I read through, I think, wow, there's a big aha, and I incorporate that into my life. But there's, there's so much in there, and my challenge is to try to bring it down to what's going to be the most and easiest way to deliver the information. And I'm fighting against, of course, the idea out there that, um, I mean, everybody knows what hedonism is. It's a is, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Like heathen? Hedonism. I don't know what that if, is. If you've ever gone to church, you know, a hedon, oh, a, a hedonist, a, a, well, a heathen is actually, yeah, it's sort of the same thing. But hedonism is 
the um, pursuit of pleasure and uh, it's it's like a self-indulgent, egotistical, bad way to be. And, and if you are um, trained in many religious traditions, uh, if you're hedonistic, it means that you are evil. That's part of your original sin. It's, it's a bad part of your nature. That's not true at all. Mm -hmm. uh, hedonism is basically just this, this principle of that we approach pleasure and that we avoid pain. What, what those kinds of thinking mm -hmm. it leave out is the fact that we're, we're born with this. There's something important about it. You know, how dare we assume that the creator or evolution or whoever put a flaw in the system. I mean, what makes us think we know better than, than when well, we don't even understand the body, let alone the mind or anything else, that there's something wrong with it. So my approach is basically to say, well, let's see where the patterns of pleasure and pain are pushing and pulling us. Mm -hmm. And that has been the basis for the entire uh, thought system that has fallen out of that. Because there are basic things <laughs> that we all need, whether uh, we're Asian or you, you know, American or whatever culture we come from, these are universal principles that operate in all of us. And once we recognize this, it's going to be a whole lot easier to design educational and political and social systems that work for everyone, and mm -hmm. where we really are free and, and allowed the opportunities to self-regulate. Because a lot of what we see as evil and sin and crime is simply someone who's being forced from the outside uh, to to do and say things that are not good for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, when when we're talking about we're talking about base, we're talking about freedom and empowerment to live your life and make your own choices. And when someone's born into a situation where the parents don't even give them the basic empowerment to answer their calls, calls for help, and the society decides that they are an outcast because they don't happen to have enough money or the right clothes or the right job opportunities, that person is already put mm -hmm. on a track that's, that's, that goes against their very needs and their very spiritual impetus. So yeah. they're rebelling against it and for real reasons. I need to say something here. Of course, we have noises in the studio again, like always. And I have some obstructions in my throat, thanks to Hanford. I, oh. That happens to me sometimes. So. Excuse me, I have to cough every once in a while. I just can't be helped. <laughs> now, back to what you were saying. Now, like the Aborigines, you know, um, they feel that when they are born, they are worthy of life. That's and beautiful. They really don't have to explain anything to anybody. And so that's basically the same. You bet. In fact, there's a, one of my favorite pages in that book talks about all of the different positive emotions, the highest mm -hmm. emotional tones. And one of those is respect. Mm -hmm. It is a feeling that is both um, given and received that there's a basic level of respect for all human life. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a human who is struggling in the depths of despair and who has had nothing but limitation and abuse and their emotional system is, is really pushing them in directions that are more destructive to themselves and to society, that person still deserves the respect of the society to offer safety net mm -hmm. interventions and opportunities to to rediscover who they are. And then there's a level of respect that I think is really earned by the person taking the initiative to find those opportunities and to take advantage of them and make the most of their life rather than sitting around and blaming all the things that happened to them in the past. Because mm -hmm. stuff does happen to us. It happens to all of us. It does. Mm -hmm. And the emotional system is asking us to take every painful experience as a learning experience. It's a growing pain. It's a corrective signal. And it pushes us literally and pulls us in the right directions. When we learn how to decode the difference between a signal of guilt and a signal of anger. We know when to change our own mm -hmm. perceptions right. and when to make changes in the outside world. They're two completely different kinds of corrections. And what we do if we're, if, if we're not on top of it consciously, our body will just push us to fight or, mm -hmm. or run away. And that'll save us for the moment. But in a cooperative modern world where we're conscious mm -hmm. entities, it, um, it doesn't work very well at all. And that's what underlies, I think, all human problems. Mm -hmm. So now, we've, uh, let's identify the points, because there is just so much in here, trying <laughs> to put it all in our, let's identify the points that we have covered. Okay. Emotions, how we start out, and how then the programming comes in, how we can change things around. Um, so on, on a one to 10, where are we in, in the program? Um. Maybe a three, huh? <laughs> uh, well, we're jumping around a little Jump, bit. Jumping around, uh-huh. Um, 
I, can, I can was, we kind of put it, can we box it there for a minute? So sure. it goes from here to here to here by point maybe. Uh, because I don't think we can put this in one show. Oh, know? no, no. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. We're not trying to do that. Um, well, do you have any questions for me right now as to no, what I'm it is? No, I'm going to let you summarize what we have done so far. Okay. And then we're going to stop there and then continue on in case we do run out of time. That's okay. what I was going to do. Okay. Well, you might think we've done a lot more than I think we have because I think we've jumped around a lot, but mm -hmm. I think we've jumped around in ways that give the friends an idea about what I'm talking about. That's right. Because that's really what we're here to do is mm -hmm. to talk about what the emotional system is because we don't really know there's a problem. And mm -hmm. so I'm offering a solution that describes the problem. And the problem basically is we're not supposed to feel pain and suffering all the time. All the time. It's a corrective signal of a deficit state, a state where we are deprived of something that we need physiologically, mentally, and spiritually. And when we can recognize that the emotional system has been given to us as a sensory system, mm -hmm. just like the eyes, the nose, and the ears, in fact, I think it's the most important sense because it guides us, it guides our consciousness in its broadest development and in our most high quality participation within the processes that are already going on. That was really good. Oh, thanks. Yeah. But that. The, the wonderful, exciting part of this is in recognizing that all of us have so much pain in our lives. There's, I mean, even from an ordinary, common, everyday person, we have um, anxieties, we have fears, we have frustrations in communicating with our loved ones. We will love someone when it was so strongly and then the next minute we'll be so angry angry we hate them and, and these we consider to be <laughs> normal me. experiences mm -hmm. but they're not. They are ups and downs of a corrective system we have not recognized how to use. And what's really exciting, and I've experimented with this for, gosh, over 10 years, is that you really do move away from the real strong feelings of fear and anger and sadness because you learn to think about things and to perceive things mm -hmm. and perhaps even be creating things in a way that is most rewarding to you. It is most, and it, of course, corresponds with the expression of all your innate value and genetic mm -hmm. potential. So it's not only good for everybody else out there, it, it's really good for you and yeah. it's what we're supposed to be doing here in life. Yeah, this is why we started out uh, in the beginning. I was trying to show people that uh, because the times that we live in, it doesn't matter where you turn, you will run into stress, you will run into pain. Uh, and you just can't get away from it because those are the times that we live in. That's right. But and as, so more, as more of us attune to what's going mm -hmm. on, we're going to make the changes mentally and externally in the world that are going to take mm -hmm. that are going to really create a completely new way of living. And it can happen relatively quickly when everyone recognizes that the positive emotions are there to guide us in these specific directions. And all the major religious traditions will also tell you the, the power of love and cooperation and faith and giving and generosity. Those are the things that feel wonderful. Mm -hmm. Once it's, it's not like we're supposed to be selfless and give of ourselves like martyrs and starve ourselves so we can feed them. That's, That's right. not it at all. We are supposed to, our, our self-concept is supposed to expand as we develop. And as that baby, every time the mother comes, very early on in life, we go from a singular me self-concept mm -hmm. to a we self-concept. We're supposed to we're supposed to have that so early on in life that we develop a natural morality. By the time we're age 18, that's much bigger and grander than than anything most religions advocate by with a simple set of mm -hmm. rules. We're moved to do the highest things for everyone else and ourselves by these feelings. And That's it right. feels good mm -hmm. to be compassionate, to deal with someone who might normally have really made you mad, yeah. to think about them in a way and perceive them in a way with the, with the kinds of respect mm -hmm. and interact with them in ways that completely changes their reality of you and your reality of them mm -hmm. in ways that enhances you both. So the, the carrot here is the most wonderful feelings mm -hmm. and the most complete and purposeful life. That's now, how we're supposed to live. Yeah, so now <laughs> that you completed this wonderful work here, um, where do you think it's going? How long do you think it'll take before it becomes part of mainstream? <laughs> um, I need to ask you that bef well, before. Um, I, I think it's wonderful that you think that I've completed something. To me, this is very um, 
although it's about the fifth or sixth version of my presenting mm -hmm. this material, both in scientific and in personal ways, it's a very, very, very first step of something I'm going to be doing many mm -hmm. times in many ways for the rest of my life. But since you asked, um, yeah, this particular works here, and it's uh, it's com to me it looks complete because <laughs> it's bounded and it's from one side to another. And there's a lot of great it, stuff in there. Is it? Yeah. So what I what I want to do with this is, in fact, if any of the friends are interested mm -hmm. in participating, I'm running some test seminars within the next six months or so here, maybe even less than that, um, where I want to share the ideas with anyone who's willing to come and listen. And there probably won't be much of a charge other than printing, if mm -hmm. even that. Um, for me, it's a chance to test this delivery system and to refine the alternative mm -hmm. ones. But um, there will be much, much, much more to come eventually. Uh, this has opened some doors for me. I just returned not too long ago from the first ever That's right. <laughs> international yeah. convention on emotional intelligence, where the whole idea of emotional intelligence that came out a few years back and kind of a public idea is that there's something good about emotion. And of course, I've been thinking and talking about it for a long time. And so I was real happy when that concept of emotional intelligence came out. But what we're really talking about is an entire sensory system that if you're using it correctly, you end up with the highest mm -hmm. kinds of emotional intelligence. So eventually, uh, what we're really hoping for, those of us that are familiar with your work, is this is going to be incorporated in some of the mainstream. Yes. Um, and that sort of yeah, way I well was that, My hope was always, I am a scientist at mm -hmm. heart, and I really wanted to, to deliver this information through the appropriate channels mm -hmm. as a scientist. But since there wasn't really anyone teaching or offering me the and mentorship opportunities of a traditional PhD path, I, I, I didn't want to give up what I was mm -hmm. really about, so I did it on my own. Um, and in the meantime, I would update some of the scientific articles and, and share them with some of the leaders in the community, hoping that maybe someone would understand the potential of the work and want to use the ideas and mm -hmm. you know test them and, and to take them more scientifically. And for the first 10 years, that didn't much happen. But at this conference that I just told you about, yeah. there really are some who I consider to be some of the most influential and the most successful in both psychology and neuroscience that are extremely interested in these ideas and, in fact, have asked me to come in and participate um, in, in a more academic capacity, mm -hmm. although my specific re, you know, uh, papers mm -hmm. would not qualify me for such an invitation. So it's really an honor to have, have the work starting to be recognized. And um, I, I probably will be participating in the positive psychology movement. Mm -hmm. So I've sort of decided that being honored by the academic community in that way, rather than to rush forward with my own publication, because I have a book, of course, that I want to write mm -hmm. that really does talk about emotion as the voice of spirit and, and to lay it all out in a very public kind of a way. But I would much rather honor the ideas with the assurance of academia first. So mm -hmm. the fact that I've been offered that opportunity is real exciting. And so I've, I've told them that I'd, I'd spend the next couple of years really working with them mm -hmm. and testing and refining the theories and give it the kind of introduction it deserves. Well, we congratulate you in advance. Thank That's you very really much. Wonderful. We're, it's, pretty, it's we're uh, gonna have to wind up here pretty soon. <laughs> and uh, but it's just it's just really exciting, and you know, it and is. I know from personal experience, my life has changed somewhat since since you've come along. And oh, uh, really? Yeah, oh my gosh! You know, we've been able to incorporate, of course, uh, some of the things that uh, some of the ideas that we have, and I've become great friends. And um, and Catherine is available for. Uh, the Olympia people, because you live in this area. I will be for the mm -hmm. next several months. For the uh, next several months, and uh, stop and say hello and talk mm -hmm. to us. And that's the whole thing. Sometimes people, uh, uh, they know us, but they, they never take the time to um, talk to us or <laughs> have us explain anything. Well, I'm a little hard to find these days, mm -hmm. but if anyone is interested in participating in um, one of these test seminars or mm -hmm. in contacting me for the information, then I'm more than welcome to. I, did you put my number in? Yeah, everything's oh, everything is in place great. and how it, how it should be. And it's just, I, I'm just really grateful that you took the time to come again. Oh, thank and, you so much and, for having me. And then shortly we're going to, like we told you, uh, now that we explained it, we're going to, uh, Catherine actually is going to show you how to put it into action, so to speak, because somewhere along the line, uh, somewhere along the line we found that uh, there's a couple of little stories you and I talk about. It's very similar. and. Um, you know, like if you can put that in, in action, your life will go a lot smoother. And uh, yeah. maybe we don't need so much Prozac. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> enjoy a nice dinner or something. Um, I'm going to thank you for having uh, came again, and I so appreciate you. Um, to the friends in Lansing, by the time that airs, uh, I'm going to be there and uh, come see me in person. And um, that'll be great. And you going on a trip also? Well, I've been invited to um, something called Summit 2000 in Washington, right. D.C., where mm -hmm. kind of the movers and shakers in the psychological community are plotting the strategy for positive psychology. So that'll be a lot of fun, and we'll sort of let it unfold. Okay, and we're letting it unfold, and now we're winding it up, and then I will tell you, come see us again next week with another uh, hopefully interesting show, and um, don't be so emotional and chill out. Do you have a